Uh, the example I always give is whenever I'm at the subway, I get this weird fear. Um, boy, it would really suck if I just fell in to the train tracks right now. Um, and I, I often get that thought as the train is coming. And it's a scary thought. And at the same time, it's not dangerous. Zach, this is Dr. Ali Matu. Welcome to the Psych Show. Hey, how are you, man? Good, doing well, doing well. Um, what's going on? How can I help? Yeah, my a year ago, I was like diagnosed with a generalized generalized uh, anxiety disorder (GAD). Yep. yep. And I had a panic attack. You know, with my psychologist, I started working with him. This is when I was living in Vegas. And then we worked on a lot of things that helped. And then I started having intrusive thoughts, and he helped me with that too. And I think it's just good to go over what intrusive, intrusive thoughts are and aren't because I think that was the biggest uh, issue for me because they felt so real and I, I was taking them too serious. There's so many reasons why people can experience intrusive thoughts too. It can come from depression. It can come from anxiety. It can come from obsessive compulsive disorder. So I think this is a good thing for us to talk about. So um what what did you learn from your experience about what is an intrusive thought and what is not? When I was talking to uh, my psychologist, uh, Dr. Jim Jobin in Vegas, and I was also reading a book, too, mm -hmm. called um, like Stopping Unwanted Intrusive Thoughts by Sally, Sally Winston. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just talking about what well, intrusive thought is, what it is. It's intrusive. It randomly pops up in, into your head. It's not a fact. Um, even though it may scare you, uh, that's a sign that you, you don't want to act on it and don't want to do it. But it was so scary to me that it, it did feel real. Because in the book, they were saying, if you go to a subway, yeah. most of the time they go, oh, what if I, I push that guy down or yeah. something like that? And the normal person is able to just brush it off. But the other person just starts questioning, like, why would I think that? What's right. wrong with me? Do I really want to do that? Or right. I think that's, that's the biggest thing you have to understand. Yeah, you know, um, I, it's funny you mentioned the subway example because when I'm working with folks, the example I always give is, uh, and I I lived in New York for a very long time. Uh, the example I always give is, whenever I'm at the subway, I get this weird fear. Um, boy, it would really suck if I just fell in to the train tracks right now. Um, and I I often get that thought as the train is coming, and it's a scary thought. And at the same time, it's not dangerous. You know, and I think that's a distinction that's hard for a lot of us, especially when we're really struggling with anxiety, is your thoughts might be scary, but they're not dangerous. You are the one who's in control of what you do. You control your actions. Your thoughts don't. And then there's a lot of ways that we can learn to deal with our thoughts and how we can change the way we react to them. But there's very little we can do to control what thoughts pop up in our mind. Um, random thoughts will always pop up in your mind, like you were just mentioning right now. You're, sometimes your your mind just kind of produces garbage. And when you're anxious, we know that your thoughts are going to be more focused on a threat, and it's going to increase the likelihood of that threat. You will see more threats and the threats will feel more real and more immediate. Do you think our brains produce uh, intrusive thoughts just to kind of keep our caveman brain intact or just to like test reality just in case something does happen? Or yeah. Just part of them? Yeah. I mean, uh, that gets back to emotions, right? Like why do they exist and why are they there? Mm -hmm. Like our, our caveman brain, the lizard brain, whatever you want to call it, it's there to keep us alive. It's there to make sure all the um, the basic stuff is is working. If you think of your brain as like these three layers, you've got the brain stem, which is just basic life functions like um, breathing and, and all that kind of stuff. Right on top of that is this thing called a limbic system, and that's where your basic emotions and memory are. And the more advanced stuff is outside of that. That's your, your frontal lobe, all the stuff that allows language and um, really complex stuff to happen. 
so that lizard brain stuff it's it's like uh it's in the middle there it's all that basic emotion stuff basic memory stuff when we're anxious our mind is just it's just trying to keep us alive it's trying to keep us safe it's trying to keep us healthy um the problem with intrusive thoughts is often if we're experiencing um, too much of that emotion for some reason or we are really scared of the thoughts that are being produced by our mind. Other people are able to just brush it off like, oh, that was weird. That's where I want to be opposed to. Oh, what is this thing? What is that? Why am I right. thinking like that? Right, right. It's something that psychologists call uh, metacognition. It's how you think about your thoughts. And so sometimes like judging it, like, wait, why am I thinking this? What's wrong with me? It can cause a lot of problems. You know, sometimes there are reasons why we might be experiencing intrusive thoughts. Maybe you're struggling with a lot of guilt about something. Um, and guilt can be a symptom of, of depression, but let's say you're not depressed, but you are you really keep thinking about this thing that you did and you feel really guilty about it. The intrusive thoughts might be there um, as a reminder of, hey, this is something that happened and you got to figure out a way to deal with it. Um, or a intrusive thought can also be related to a major stressor that you're facing. So if you've got, if you got a big test coming up and you keep thinking about it and you don't feel prepared, that intrusive thought might be working to help you to take action on that. But uh, I'm, I'm guessing the kind of thoughts that you were experiencing were less so about about the, uh, less so about these specific things that had uh, where there's like a clear relationship between this happened and now I'm experiencing this thing. Um, what, what what was it more like for you? When I first had my panic attack, and I didn't know it was a panic attack, I went to the hospital. You know, did mm -hmm. all the tests, EKG, ultrasound, mm -hmm. blood work. It all came back normal, and then from there. I think every little like sensation in my body, I started to feel my pulse constantly. And I'm like, oh my God, it's, you know, at 90 you know, beats yeah. per second. I was like, I'm freaking out. And yeah, I think ever since that panic attack, it just scared the living like heck out of me. Yeah. And then once I got, you know, that under control, just not freaking out over every little, you know, I, I would take like a little brisk walk and like, oh my God, my heart's beating worse. What if I drop that? Am I having a heart attack yeah. and all that? Yeah. So I had like health anxiety uh, for a little bit, and then the intrusive thoughts they were they were um, just like random self harming thoughts mm -hmm. that my uh, psychologist that we went over he was telling me yeah thoughts are not real if they were he just wish imagine a million dollars right now see if that happens <laughs> like, if, that, if that happens then we have a lot of plans to do that's a really great example of something I've seen with a lot of folks I work with. So uh, starting with the panic attack, um, you know, panic is really about a fear of fear sensations. It's, it's related to anxiety about those things going on inside of you, about that heart rate, about sweating, about feeling, um, feeling not normal, um, how you usually feel, and often a worry that is this going to lead to a panic attack. So that's, that's really common. And the other thing you're talking about, too, is these, um, these fears of self-harm, of, of doing something that you might regret. You know, the, the common thread I'm seeing here for you, but also for a lot of folks I work with, is this loss of control. This, and this fear of losing control, either of your body or of your mind, of your thoughts. And that can be really scary. It can be really scary to, to feel that way. The, the place that it sounds like you've gotten to is a place of realizing that, you know, your body goes up and down during the day based upon what you're doing. You climb some stairs, your heart's going to be racing. Or depending on what you eat, you might have more gas or your stomach might grumble or things might not sit as well. And then the more we focus on them, the worse they tend to get or the more aware you become of all these other weird things happening in your body. That's often what happens with panic. And then these weird self-harm thoughts 
you know, we all get weird thoughts like that from time to time. And it's just, um, it's just not in our control. That's uh, one thing we went over when I first started going to uh, see a therapist is just, he gave me, you know, homework to take home. Mm-hmm. Is uh, What you said earlier, that meta something, is that the same? Metacognition. Is that the same as cognitive distortion? Because that's what we were talking about, like catastrophizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, the cognitive distortions, there's there's a whole bunch of them, like catastrophizing is, is a big one. Mind reading is another one, like imagining you know how people are thinking about you. Um, uh, one of my favorites is emotional reasoning, is you believe this thing is true, but it might just because you you have a very strong feeling, like you're really anxious, so you feel like, oh, this thing has to be true. Uh, cognitive distortions are the ways in which your mind warps information because of how it's feeling. Well, that also gets at different ways we can deal with intrusive thoughts. You know, the, one of the things that I like to tell people is it's about getting unstuck with your thoughts. Um, sometimes you can do things that will help you change your thoughts. Um, sometimes you can't. But what all of us can do is we can get less stuck with our thoughts. Well, that means a little bit of what you're talking about is noticing the patterns and noticing how, oh, yeah, I always kind of catastrophize in this situation or, um, you know, I, I always kind of think in this way. Sometimes that can create a little bit of distance for us and help us to get unstuck with them. Um, sometimes it's more about acceptance and acceptance is not saying like, oh, this thought is great. I'm glad I'm, I'm having it. It's not that at all. It's about letting go of that tug of war that you're having with your thoughts, like not playing the game saying like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to fight this thought. This is just some weird random thought that I have and thoughts are just thoughts. Um, sounds like a, a little bit of that is actually something that helped you. It's also something that always helps me when I get that weird thought of, uh, when I'm on the subway. And then another one is um, finding a way to cope with those thoughts, coping statements. So um, thoughts are thoughts might be scary but not dangerous. That's one of my favorite coping statements. Um, sounds like this one that, uh, your, your therapist helped you with, like how many times have you intentionally made plans to, with, with the goal of canceling on someone that kind of like, that was, that kind of got you into your head about, wait, wait, like, what have I done in this situation? You know, when it it comes to mind reading, so many times we're good at giving advice to other people, but we don't give ourselves that advice. So I like to tell people when they're struggling with mind reading, what would you tell your friend if they came to you with this fear? Like everyone thinks I'm stupid because I like muffled on this, like this part of the speech. Like, what would you tell your friend? You know, most of us would say like, yeah, okay. I, like maybe some people notice that, but if they're like judging you based on that one thing, like, like, are they the kind of person you you want to care about? You know, whatever it might be, yeah. like finding a way to be able to cope with that thought um, that can help. And the, the last thing I'd like to tell people is, okay, let's use it. Um, let's try to understand why you might be dealing with this intrusive thought. Um, sometimes, like what I was saying before, maybe people are dealing with a lot of guilt and about something that happened and they're having these intrusive thoughts. So we need to do something about them. We might need to change a situation. Um, another thing, I'm just listing, I'm just making this a giant list now. But um, mm-hmm. another thing is um, sometimes we need exposure. And that means testing out what actually happens. So this we often do with conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder, where someone might have a fear that they're going to take a knife and they're going to hurt someone. So we might do an exposure where someone is actually holding a knife and then um, we see what happens. And um, we see if they can tolerate the uncertainty of that of not knowing what they're going to do. Um, and then the last thing that often comes up with intrusive thoughts is um, 
finding activities that you can get absorbed into to make it a little bit easier to um, to not pay attention to those thoughts. So, for example, sometimes intrusive thoughts can keep us up late at night. And so are there other things we can do late at night that will really absorb our mind, help us to get nice and tired, and make it a little bit easier to fall asleep? So that was a massive list, but I'm just kind of curious what what from there was kind of like resonating with you or, or what didn't resonate with you. It brings me back to that book I read. Uh, there's an audio, too, on YouTube, but Sally was talking yeah. about um yeah just the thoughts they're not it's not a message it's not a red flag it's not part of your unconscious that might leap out if you're not vigilant mm-hmm. it's just a thought kind of like what you just said i think that's just the big part of just one of the big parts of just understanding it that it's just you know you think of other thoughts and this one thought is just bothering you and if it's bothering you you clearly don't want to do it especially if you're having a, like a panic attack, a panic attack over it There's this uh, treatment called acceptance and commitment therapy, and it's one of the newer cognitive behavioral uh, treatments out there. I say newer, but it's it's kind of been around for for a while now. A lot of research has been done on it. And one of my favorite things about ACT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, they hate it when you call it ACT, though. They always say it's it's about acting. It's about living. So. There's that disclaimer. But um, one of my favorite things about ACT is they have all of these metaphors and these analogies that they use to help people get unstuck with their thoughts. Um, one of my favorite ones is uh, passengers on the on, on the bus. Have you heard this one before? Not yeah, I don't think I've shared this on the channel yet. But it's it's basically this idea that imagine that you are driving this bus. Um, you control the bus and you you're you're driving on your route you got to get from a to z so you stop over and you pick up some passengers and they get on the bus and they sit on the bus some of them are loud some of them are supportive of you they're saying hey you're doing a great job some of them are uh, super critical and saying no you're going the wrong way what are you doing you're an idiot so uh, to make a long story short those People on the bus, they those passengers, they represent your thoughts. And some of your thoughts are going to be supportive. Some of them aren't. But those thoughts can't do anything to change what you're doing. No passenger can cross that white line on the bus that divides you, the driver, from everyone who's on the bus. You're the one who chooses where the bus goes. You go on your route. And you can do that route despite whoever comes or goes on the bus, despite whatever thought you have on the bus. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. And then I have a, uh, another question. Mm-hmm. But say there's two different people I was talking about earlier. The one person that has that weird thought, it could be about anything, like, oh, what if I push that guy in the subway? Mm-hmm. What if I'm transgender? What if I'm yada, 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 all that. The person that's able to just brush it off and not worry about it versus, versus the person that worries about it. I know it might be hard to like answer very concisely, mm-hmm. but what do, what do you think the difference is between those two people? Is one person more of a like deeper analytical creative thinker, thinker, or just the other one able just to let things go easier? Yeah, that's a great question, and I've I've noticed that in my own work as well. Um, mm-hmm. in my, my specialty is in anxiety, and so, <laughs> there's so many ways in which people can experience anxiety and so many ways in which people can struggle with anxiety. Um, So I can work with one person who might, their anxiety might be 100% just intrusive thoughts. And I can work with another person, their anxiety is 100% physical in their body. And then I can work with another person who doesn't experience it in their body, doesn't experience it through intrusive thoughts. They just avoid situations. Like their main anxiety problem is they just don't put themselves in in any situation that makes them distressed. So to answer your question, part of it comes from biology. So um, temperament is how intensely you experience certain emotions. And all of us genetically inherit different temperaments doesn't mean you can you can blame one of your parents but it does mean that your unique dna 
makes you more or less vulnerable to experiencing certain emotions. I often say on the channel, the volume for some people is set higher for certain emotions and the volume for other people is set lower for different emotions. And that's just, that's just the gene pool. That's just how things are um, um, set up. So part of it is biology. So some of us are more vulnerable to experiencing different emotions. And then part of it also comes from your life experience. So people, um, I'd have to dig into the research to see if there's evidence to back this up, but this is something I've definitely noticed in, um, in my work is people who are much more verbal, people who read a lot, people who have um, a pretty... Um, pretty good uh, language skills, they tend to be a bit more vulnerable to worrying than mm. people who might have um, less developed language. And um, I, I think there is a lot of, of data linking okay. reading and literacy skills with more cognitive skills, like thinking skills. Like apparently, apparently college professors are really, really good at rationalizing their actions and behaviors because they're so like verbal like almost to a degree where it's a problem because they can they can outthink any type of criticism that comes their way well mm -hmm. there's also a problem to that which is you could be more vulnerable to having a lot of worries and, and things like that so it could be that um some people with with certain language skills are just more vulnerable to experiencing worries. And another thing to say here is part of it can also be skill. So you've learned a lot through a lot of hard work how to approach your worries and how to approach that type of anxiety. Some people haven't had that experience. And um, if that's the case then you might not know how to deal with worries. Or another, uh, probably a better example is when we go through stuff the first time, we're going to experience more worries. We're going to experience more anxiety, and that's just normal. Your first breakup is horrible because you just haven't had the life experience yet of knowing that eventually you will feel okay again. So it's only more common and only natural to experience a ton of worries about that kind of stuff. Like you were saying, any other tips, uh, not necessarily just for anxiety, but just, I guess, good de-stressor tips. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So let's talk about stress. Let's talk about anger. And then let's talk about um, intrusive thoughts and like some quick tips on and what to do about that kind of stuff. Um, the quickest tip I've got is uh, check out the video I just put out um, last week, I think, or maybe a week before. It was a uh, quick anxiety relief, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I go through some of my favorite um, ways to quickly reduce anxiety. So check that one out. Um, and then I've got another one on... Um, it's like a 90 second video on um, how to overcome stress, something like that. So I'll put links in this video to both of those. But um, uh, let's, let's talk that out. Let's, let's talk about anger real quick because um, anger I think is one that a lot of us really struggle with. Is it healthy like every so often to be, to express anger? In some totally. Way? Or can, we, can humans live without being like ever angry? What I 100% I completely believe it is um, a necessary emotion, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Compared to every other emotion, anger is the most powerful way to break you out of your daily routine and get you to act. Anger is completely, completely normal when some kind of injustice has happened, when you are really being blocked from some type of goal that's important to you, um, it anger is um, anger will communicate will get you out of your routine, and it will very quickly communicate to the other person that they've done some wrong in some way, or something needs to happen that that has to change. You're right, though. Also, that too much anger is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna get um, you're gonna get really frustrated, and the other thing too with with high degree of anger is 
anger does kind of break you out of the mold, right? So it might, if if you're experiencing so much anger that it's putting you at risk of doing something that might cause you harm or some other people harm, then anger can be a problem. Just like too much anxiety can um, make you feel paralyzed and keep you imprisoned in your life. Like too much of any of these things can be a problem. So the the first thing to kind of think about is um, the stereotype of anger, which is punch a pillow, something like that, get the anger out. That doesn't really work. Um, what what it does is it revs you up more. When you do that, when you're angry, it will rev you up more. Um, it's a little bit different than going for a run or exercise or like doing like a kickboxing class or something like that. Those things are a little bit different because they're more focused. Um, it gets your whole body going in an activity. Those kind of things can be fine, but doing something aggressive like punching a pillow or like hitting a wall or something like that or screaming, um, those kind of things don't really help out with anger. The better thing with anger is something called distress tolerance, which basically means doing things that give you a little bit of a break and kind of push away from the thing that's pissing you off for a little bit of time. So for example, if if you're, if you're yelling at someone, so like my wife and I, we get into a disagreement, I'm getting really pissed off. I will, I will say I need a break. I'll be back later and I'll go into my room and I will watch something funny on YouTube or I'll listen to music that chills me out or I'll go for a walk outside. I need to get away from that thing. Let my body cool down. Then I can go back and then we can kind of deal with that situation or whatever it was. And then, well, let me just check in. How's that, how's that sitting with you um, in terms of your experience with anger? No, no, yeah, that's uh, that's good. That's like everyone should have uh, those tools just to, you know, from a keep a different perspective. Like you said, if you're, you know, get served the wrong meal, you don't need to blow up and just yeah. go crazy. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to. And you, I do want you to listen to that anger and and deal with it in some way. So, you know, you might want to say... You might want to say something to the waiter, um, and it, it, you don't have to blow up and you don't have to yell at them. But if you if you keep ignoring that anger over and over again, that's when people can kind of snap. Is if the, if that anger kind of goes unresolved and you're not listening to it, does acting on this emotion does it help you with your goals? You know, if you're at a really crowded restaurant um, and it's it's like the meal you got is okay. It's not what you wanted, but you're still cool with it. Does acting on your anger help you? Well, like, okay, maybe they'll find you another meal. Maybe it's going to take longer. Maybe it's not worth it. Then maybe you don't even say anything and you just kind of complain to your friend. But if it's like, let's say you're a vegetarian and you got steak, like you're probably not going to eat that. You probably need to to act on that anger so think about like does acting on it um does it help you does it help you reach your goals and if so then find some way to be able to express that or or act on that Mm -hmm. um similar thing with stress zach um you got to there's a great ted talk called how to make friends with your stress and and the gist of it is basically we we have to understand what we're stressed about and then do things that help us with that that like stress isn't something we can ignore or get rid of because then it's it's just like the intrusive thoughts you can't you can't get rid of those thoughts just like you can't get rid of stress the way we deal with stress is by understanding okay why am i stressed is it I'm unprepared? Is it because I need help? Is it because I'm confused? Is it because I did everything and now I'm just kind of waiting for this thing to resolve itself? Like, what is it that is making you stressed? And then what can you do to deal with that? Like, if, you, if you're if you stressed because you don't know what to do, then you got to get help. 
right? If you're uh, stressed because you there's so much to do, then how can you get started and make a little bit of contact with this problem? If you're stressed because you're just waiting to get your grades back on something and there's nothing you can do but wait, then all right, what are some fun things you can do that'll take your mind off stress for, for some time being until you get closer to that date? So for stress, we got to we got to understand what's going on and then we have to deal with those uh, those problems whatever they might be for anxiety um and uh and how to chill out um you know it's anything that is going to help you make contact with your anxiety in a healthy way that's a good coping skill to use so for example um, give me something that you might be stressed about and, and let's see if we can come up with a good coping skill there. Uh, I'll just do the typical, like you have a lot of homework to do or a test coming up or a project and you're kind of just hammering, you know, I gotta, I gotta get this done. Right. Right. Okay. So I got, I got all this homework. I got this test coming up. I need to get started on it. I'm really anxious about it. So a coping skill here, it's going to be whatever helps you to get closer to that homework whatever helps you to get closer to studying for that exam that's going to be a good coping skill so um for me one of the things that um helped me in college was um kind of making a pact with one of my roommates like i gotta do this one thing tonight um hey frankie i need you to like check in with me and help me to make sure i do that um, and then he might make a pack with me like, okay, I'll do that. I got to do this thing. Like we're going to, you and I, we're just going to get that done today. Like for me, that was awesome. I need the accountability. Uh, the accountability doesn't stress me out more. It, it actually helps me. Um, the worst thing for me is if I'm kind of like hiding in secret, avoiding my work and just like watching Netflix, like that's, that's like danger yeah. zone. Right. But there's other folks I know that I work with, like, what helps them, a good coping skill for them, watching something they've seen a million times on Netflix, putting it on, turning the volume down, but getting started on homework that is super easy for them, like just getting organized, just getting the ball moving, and then they can tackle harder and harder stuff, and then maybe they turn off the Netflix. Yeah, I feel like for me, uh, not just for school or, or you know, in, in general, just if I want to get something done, I feel like just for me is uh, just being organized, mm -hmm. making sure even when I like walk into my room, like I make sure it's like vacuumed and the bed is at least made because I feel like walking into the room when it's dirty and you have a lot of stuff to do just adds on to it. I yep. feel like just being organized in just everyday life is just, you know, what a, even as simple as just, I don't, I don't need you to go to the gas station and pick up some ice cream. Yeah. Just be organized and do that don't just be around oh look at it look at that restaurant let me just stop there real quick and then it's going, oh let me stop here let me talk to this person right right well that's a really good example of what can be a coping behavior for some can be a safety behavior for another so mm -hmm. coping behavior good stuff that helps you to move forward and make contact with whatever goal you have safety behavior is something that you might do that makes you feel a little bit less anxious, but it's actually keeping you away from the thing you want to do. So for some people, getting organized, getting cleaned up, getting everything in the right place, that actually helps them. It helps them to want to get work done. It helps them to know what work to do. It makes you feel accomplished. It makes you feel less overwhelmed. Other people, um, sometimes in my life I've done this where I'm like, oh man, I got to write this paper today. All right, well, hold on first. I'm just going to like clean up my whole room. And then it's been like five hours and my room's clean, but like I haven't made any contact with the work I got to do. So that's where it's like trial and error and it's knowing ourselves and just thinking, all right, what's one small step I can take right now to move forward on my goals? And if you want to watch more episodes in this call-in show series, check out the pop-up that's popping up right now to see all the episodes. Uh, Zach, thanks for being on the call.